Good evening. So, best things always come at the end. We've had a great conference, but uh, the best things you get only at the end. And uh, there is this uh, saying in uh, Hindi. Uh, so, if I translate it into English, and of course, no language can beat Arabic in terms of poetry, but what they say is that uh, the learning you get from a chairperson and also the benefits you get from the Indian gooseberry. Uh, it's very rich in vitamin C that you get to know only afterwards. So the words of a wise man and the benefits of good food that you get to know only later. Similarly, the benefits of the last and the second last lecture that you get to know only later when you go back into practice. We'll talk about oral glucose lowering drugs. And the reason we have to talk about them is because there are so many of them and the challenges are there. Now, when I was a student, life was so nice and easy. We had metformin and we had glabenclamide. So that was the entire, uh, you know, universe of oral glucose lowering drugs for us. That is why I was able to pass my pharmacology exams. And that is why I, that is why I was able to navigate through internal medicine. Because we just had to learn permutations, combinations of two. Now there are so many drugs. And uh, Bahrain is a developed country. Bahrain is a rich country. But even then, you have to count cost. And when we look at health economic data from Bahrain, we see that uh, persons living with diabetes cost the national economy three times more than persons who do not live with diabetes. And when you get admitted in hospital, persons living with diabetes cost another three times more than those who do not have diabetes. So actually, the 20% uh, of patients who have diabetes once they get admitted into hospital, they consume 60% of all our resources. So it would be good if we could treat them or with the oral drugs, treat them in a way so that they do not need to get admitted. That is one statement. The second statement is that if it was that simple, we would not have to have conferences like these. Diabetes comes with complications like with nephropathy. It comes with comorbid conditions like with NAFLD. These are just two examples from Bahrain. We have good quality data. And the point here is that whenever you are managing diabetes, you have to look not only at glucose, but also at so many other caveats, the comorbid conditions, the complications. Like I said, uh, earlier life was good. We had only two drugs to choose from. But now we have at least seven classes of drugs which are approved across the world. In India, we have two more actually apart from this. In India, bromocryptine is approved for the management of type 2 diabetes. It is approved in the US as well. And we have a new drug called imeglimin, which is an oxidative phosphorylase uh, modifier. We'll talk about that as well. So there are so many drugs. The more the number of classes, the more the number of permutations combinations. Then people living with diabetes are developing diabetes earlier. That is one headache then they are surviving longer, which is nice. So you have to look at the entire spectrum of uh, life, different age groups. People with diabetes will present with different types of glucotypes or glucophenotypes. Someone will come in with a fasting hyperglycemia, another one with postprandial, yet another one with mixed. Someone will have a lot of hypoglycemia, a lot of glycemic variability. So that's a challenge. And then, of course, we've already talked about complications and comorbid conditions. But still, uh, so I'm also not very good at English and I am very poor at Latin, though I have been learning Latin now on Duolingo for the past uh, five months, I think. So this new word I learned, quadriga. So I just had to share it with everyone. Quadriga means a chariot that is run by four horses. Now that I've shared it, I'm very happy with life. So these are the four horses we have to tame in diabetes care. You have to keep them in control. Glucose, blood pressure, lipids, and weight. If we can control all four with one whip, with one drug, that would be nice. And this is something that is important for Bahrain as well. All four have to be tamed together. You cannot say that I will make one horse run very fast, the other four, the other three do not need to run at all, then the chariot is going to collapse. It will not move. So this quadriga is important. Another thing that is important is uh, the, definition of, uh, the definition of nutrition. So earlier, scientists recognized only one type of malnutrition. That is protein energy malnutrition. We spoke about this yesterday as well. 
Then they recognized obesity and overweight as another type of malnutrition. And now we recognize hidden hunger, that is micronutrient deficiency. That is why yesterday we spoke of anemia. But if you were to use a drug for diabetes management, uh, it would be nice if that drug could ensure micronutrient sufficiency. And if it cannot assure that, the least it should be able to do is, we should, we should be able to do is to prevent micronutrient deficiency from occurring. Now, so much so about the challenges. Let us come to what the patient wants. All what we talked about was philosophical, was theoretical so far. Now, when the patient comes to you, in acute medicine, we learn that we first have to ask for symptoms, then we have to elicit signs. In diabetes, so often the patient is asymptomatic. So here we use the word complaints and concerns. When the patient comes to you, what is it that the patient wants? You ask her, Madam, what are your complaints? What are your concerns? And then there is a method of optimization. The first thing is to give symptomatic well-being. After that, you look for glucometabolic optimization. You need to give good glucose numbers. But in diabetes care, that is not enough. You also have to offer vasculometabolic and viscerometabolic optimization. Vasculometabolic would mean macro and microvascular. And viscerometabolic actually is the entire body. So how do you look at it? And another term is barometabolic. Baro means weight. So wherever ectopic fat can be deposited, in the retropharynx, obstructive sleep apnea, in the liver, NAFLD, fatty pancreas, fatty ovary, the equivalent would be PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome. So you look for all these organ systems and try to optimize their health. Do not forget the eyes and ears. We give aspirin, that is ototoxic. So be aware of that as well. So you have to fix each and everything. But you cannot do everything in 10 minutes in one OPD setting. So if you have this pyramid in your mind, first ask the patient, Madam, symptomatic well-being, how are you doing? Glucose, how are your numbers? Are you concerned about any vascular health, any visceral health? Let me help you. So that is the way to do it. And you do not have to do everything in one setting. You can say, okay, Madam, right now let me focus on your fasting and postprandial. Tomorrow, I will focus on your liver health. That is also fine. You can always have a lo longitudinal approach. And now that we have this in mind, now let us come to solutions. Let's talk about solutions. That is our talk for today. How do you put all these different types of drugs in a system, in a system that we can follow? So here we learn from our colleagues in surgery. If you have a fluctuant abscess, you can give bacteriostatic antibiotics, you can give bactericidal antibiotics and you can do an incision and drainage. All our glucose lowering drugs can be classified in this manner. Our insulin sensitizers are glucostatic. Our insulin secretagogues are glucosidal. And the SGLT2 inhibitors and acarbose, they are like the incision and drainage. They are nutrient load reducers or calorie restriction mimetics. Now let's do this one by one. The insulin sensitizers can be directly acting like metformin and pioglitazone. The insulin secretagogues that are available can be directly acting like glimepride, glyclazide, and they can act indirectly through the incretin pathway, both DPP-4 inhibitors and GLP-1-RA. Of course, this is a classification which is making it easy for us to understand. GLP-1-RA will also have an impact on insulin sensitivity. But this is a kind of a linear approach or a tabular approach which helps us understand how to combine drugs together. And the third one is uh, nutrient load reducers. They reduce the load of carbohydrate on the body because diabetes by definition is a state of carbohydrate intolerance. In type 2 diabetes, you cannot tolerate carbohydrates. In type 1 also, you cannot tolerate a carbohydrate load. So how do you reduce the carbohydrate? Either you stop eating, that is one thing, you can go into starvation. But another method is you can reduce the absorption of carbohydrates by giving acarbose or you can enhance the excretion of carbohydrates by giving SGL2 inhibitors. So this is a classification which serves me in my OPD and when I want to pick 
drugs or a combination of drugs, I usually pick one from the sensitizer, one from the secretagogue, and one from the nutrient load reducer category. This, is, this would be my commonest approach. Of course, not for everyone. If the HB1C is below 7.5, I will manage with one drug. If the HB1C is around 8, 8.5, then I will take two drugs to start with. And if it is beyond 9, then I can take three to begin with as well. Another classification is uh, similar to what we have just shown. It's just that here we differentiate between calorie restriction mimetics and calorie restrictors. So GLP-1RA, we have them available in Bahrain. Semaglutide is there and I think dulaglutide is also available, liraglutide. These restrict calories. They restrict our hunger. They improve satiety. So you have calorie restrictors and you have calorie restriction mimetics. There is an overlap, but there is a difference as well. And then, how do we use them? Now, we assume that in a developed country, the number of people coming to you with symptoms will be minimal. They will not have symptoms of diabetes. If at all they have symptoms, the symptoms will be of complications or comorbid conditions. However, if you work in a primitive setting, then you will have patients coming in with symptoms of diabetes, polyuria, polyphagia, polydipsia, weight loss. That is how patients present with. If you've taken care of that, then what do you want to manage? It depends upon the main concern of the patient. If the concern is heart disease, then it would be a good idea to use a calorie restriction mimetic like SGL2 inhibitor or GLP-1RA. If the main issue is heart failure, then SGL2 inhibitors will be the drug of choice. And if the main issue is chronic kidney disease, you want to prevent progression, then again, SGL2 inhibitors will be a drug of choice. We have another drug available now in the international market that is finirinone. It is an MRA, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, and that is also a drug of choice for preventing progression of kidney disease. That is, it is not a hypoglycemic drug, it is not glucose lowering, it can be added to pre-existing therapy including ACE inhibitor or ARB. The same things come across whether you look at uh, European guidelines or British guidelines, American guidelines, whether you look at guidelines from the diabetology experts or from the endocrinology experts. But in general what all of them talk about is individualized pharmacotherapy. But there are so many individuals in our OPD and there are so many drugs. So here we are speaking about pragmatic uh, approach and let's continue with that discussion. How do we decide within a few minutes, within a few seconds, what kind of combination to give our patients? So this is one way of looking at it and you will see that we are sharing various models. All these models uh, will help us become more efficient in our treatment. This model says that if the HB1C level is less than 7.5, you can manage with monotherapy. Give metformin because it is economical, it is effective. If, however, you cannot use metformin for any reason, then GLP-1RA or SGLT2 inhibitors. Which GLP-1RA or which SGLT2 inhibitor will you use? We can compare based upon the level of evidence. So the level of evidence is strongest for empagliflozin in SGLT2 inhibitors and it is strongest for liraglutide and semaglutide in GLP-1RA. So we can use those. These drugs will be used independent of their effect on glycemic control. Because if you remember our work, our responsibility, it was not just to give symptomatic and glucometabolic control. We also have to give vasculo and viscero-metabolic benefit. So these drugs offer vasculo and viscero-metabolic benefit as well. Now, if the A1C is more than 7.5 to begin with, then in general, I would start a, GL, a dual action or dual combination. And that is what the guidelines say as well. Here, the guidelines say you give metformin plus one more drug. Now, if you want safety first for your patient, you think your patient is not going to come back for the next six months. She is not very good at monitoring glucose. She is at high risk of hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia. Then DPP-4 inhibitor would be the first choice. Uh, linagliptin, cetagliptin, whatever you feel like, along with metformin. What are the high-risk patients for hypoglycemia? Three 
मेडिकल कॉजेस रीनल इम्पेयरमेंट हेपैटिक इम्पेयरमेंट गैस्ट्रो इंटेस्टाइनल इम्पेयरमेंट गैस्ट्रो इंटेस्टाइनल इम्पेयरमेंट ऑल्टर्ड एपिटाइट ऑल्टर्ड एब्जॉर्बशन ऑल्टर्ड मोटिलिटी थ्री एंडोक्राइन फैक्टर्स विच विल प्री डिस्पोज टू हाइपोग्लाइसीमिया हाइपो पिच्यूट्री हाइपो थाइरॉयड हाइपो एड्रीनल हाइपो पिच्यूट्री हाइपो थाइरॉयडिज्म एंड एडिसंस डिजीज एंड थ्री डेमोग्राफिक फैक्टर्स और पेशेंट कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स विच विल प्री डिस्पोज टू हाइपोग्लाइसीमिया वन इज द एज ऑफ द पेशेंट सो एल्डरली पेशेंट्स आर मोर प्रोन टू हाइपो द सेकेंड इज डाइट्री हैबिट्स is the patient able to and willing to take regular meals and the third is social support is the patient living alone or is she living as part of a happy family you have to ask that history as well in india you have to ask about happiness as well uh, so you ask the elderly lady do you stay with your uh, family yes do you stay with your daughter in law yes is she happy cooking for you no so that is high risk hypoglycemia so that history has to be taken do i would uh, say that uh, i think the best smiles uh, i have traveled throughout the world sir but the best smiles i see in bahrain i have never seen such a smiling country before so that was uh, single and dual but assuming that you are not worried about hypoglycemia then the drug of choice to add to metformin would again be glp1 ra or sgl2 inhibitor and we have mentioned those figures unless there is a contraindication triple therapy is often required so if the a1c is above 8.5 9 then triple therapy but if your patient is symptomatic patient has got symptoms of hyperglycemia polyuria polydipsia then sdl2 inhibitors will not be a good drug of choice remember that pyramid again first you have to give symptomatic well being so if your patient's first complaint is i have polyuria i have to get up at night sometimes i have uh, urinary incontinence as well i am struggling with that so how many times have we actually asked our elderly patients madam do you have to use a diaper or not have you ever felt socially uh, uh, uncomfortable because of this maybe no would, no one would have ever asked that lady or that gentleman so first you fix that up you say let me correct your symptoms now after that i will think of sgl2 inhibitor i would like to speak about another aspect of history taking here now when you go to the general public to the media they say that we are medicalizing normal things so we are unnecessarily giving treatment for menopause for andropause for diabetes for subclinical hypothyroidism but look at the other side medical issues are being normalized as well now supposing i am a 70 year old lady or a 70 year old gentleman i have got urinary incontinence whom will i speak with first i will speak with my sister or sister in law brother or brother in law 90% of the time the answer will come i have also got urinary incontinence so then i assume that it is normal part of life i want to go to the mosque and pray i want to do tarawih prayers and i speak with uh, whom will i speak with i speak with my brother who is of the same age and i say you know i don't think i am able to do the prayers now my knees hurt so it's the same thing happens to me also so i am normalizing a medical issue while actually if i had gone and spoken with my doctor they would give me a treatment for the urinary incontinence or they would give me a treatment for my arthritis so this is something i think as a diabetes uh, experts as physicians we should be able to take this history and if you are able to tease this out sometimes all that is required is simple vitamin d and you can actually bring a smile back to that patient's life you can improve his or her quality of life so we go on we come back to our topic uh, but this uh, does tell us that we are speaking about everything under the sun and that is actually what diabetes care is about when you have to choose an oed you have to think of everything under the sun Uh, the british guidelines are also similar and if you look at the american or european guidelines they do not talk about dpp4 inhibitor as well but you see that when i spoke of dual therapy i put dpp4 inhibitor first safety first if you are worried about safety dpp4 inhibitor if you want efficacy sulfonylurea and if you want cardiovascular benefit visceral benefit then sgl2 inhibitor and glp1 are but if you look at the british guidelines they put dpp4 inhibitor right on top after metformin part of the reason is maybe cost 
and the other part of the reason would be that uh, it's easy to use so in in a public health system where multiple people are treating multiple patients dpp4 inhibitor usage is associated with minimal risk so first we spoke of problems challenges now we are trying to get our heads together and we are trying to create a structure in our mind but still that structure is not created so let us move on let let us complete our talk with a few structures with a few rubrics with a few frameworks that we can actually use in our opd various models are there for diabetes control this is the simplest binary model verocentric or barocentric so for obese people you will have a different therapy for non obese people you will have a different therapy metformin you can use in everyone but if your patient is underweight malnourished there will be no one like that in bahrain do remember that metformin is a mitochondrial toxin it is also a calorie restriction mimetic so if your patient is already restricted in terms of calories patient is underweight patient has got pancreatic diabetes malabsorption then metformin is not going to help at all but if patient is normal weight or overweight you can use metformin pyoglitazone would help in someone who wants to increase body weight so in my part of india we have the policemen coming in and saying or the or the, you know the village head or chief they come and say doctor my only concern is i want to gain weight so i say you look handsome you're looking good what is it that you want so doctor sir you try to understand you know when i walk in the village i need to have this swag i need to have the swagger if i am not obese people don't listen to me so i have to be heavier than everyone else in my village the policeman will also come and say the same thing so pyoglitazone for them the modern sulfonylureas glimepiride glycolazide for virtually everyone dpp4 inhibitor for everyone we are speaking of weight and for those who are overweight sgl2 inhibitor like empa or glp1 are in insulin also if the patient is overweight you will do well to give basal insulin plus an injectable glp1 are but if patient is underweight you will have to give a little bit of prandial insulin whether you give as basal bolus or premix that is separate matter so that was binary but this binary thought process overweight underweight is actually underpinned by a lot of physiology lot of endocrinology so let us use the same model now and let us call it the metabolic triage so when patients walk into your opd not only will you look at the weight you will also look at the blood pressure the lipids the metabolic quadriga and you will be able to have three pictures in your mind so the first is mal adaptive anabolism uh, that is my phenotype i am anabolic but it is mal adaptive so overweight high bp high lipids uh, the pathophysiology insulin resistance this is what you will see in most diabetes patients from the arab community it is insulin resistance here our drug of choice will be metformin plus glp1 ra or sgl2 inhibitor at the other end of the spectrum predominant catabolic state catabolic means lean and thin cachexic osmotic symptoms insulin deficiency here the treatment is insulin but if you want to give an oral drug it will be glimepiride or glycolazide the third one in between eubolic e eubolic so of course the glucose metabolism is disturbed but the rest of it is normal the bp the lipids the weight is normal here you can choose whatever you want dpp4 inhibitors would be a good choice actually here you can give uh, glp1 or your sgl2 inhibitors if you wish so now from 2 we move to 3 so we have three types of patients now anabolic catabolic and eubolic and we are trying the treatments on top of metformin for those who are interested in uh, science and in rational there is a reason insulin glucagon ratio is linked with this in maladaptive anabolic people we will have high insulin levels in predominant catabolic people we will have a low insulin glucagon ratio biochemistry also amp kinase that is a hormone that that is an enzyme in the mitochondria amp activation is needed in anabolism ampk suppression is needed in catabolism and later on we may wish to use the insulin glucagon ratio actually as a means of deciding choice uh, our glucose lowering therapy 
though we would not uh, recommend this in practice, it doesn't make sense, but as a, as a theoretical construct, what all this tells us is that our metabolic triage is a very sound, a very sound framework upon which to choose our therapy. So first we spoke of binary, verocentric, then we moved to a triple kind of a model, catabolic, anabolic, eubolic. Let me just move one step ahead and from three we go on to four. And we will not go beyond four because the state that I come from in India, we are known actually for our lack of skills in uh, English and arithmetic. Uh, we are famous only for wrestling and boxing. So this is the glycemic personality. And a sure short way of understanding the glycemic personality of your patient is to remember the word sure, S-U-R-E. S for severity and style of hyperglycemia. U for urgency and utility of control. So the glucose may be 10 millimole, 20 millimole, it can be 40. But the patient has got CA pancreas with metastasis all over the body. Is there a utility of controlling glucose? It's not there. All you have to do is give the maximum symptomatic relief. So for someone who is going to just last maybe six months, what is the utility in giving a GLP-1 RA or an SGL-2 inhibitor? It's not there. So there our approach will be different. So S for severity and style, U for urgency and utility of control. These are the two action-oriented domains of the glycemic personality. And the two caution-oriented domains are R for risk of hypoglycemia, we mentioned that already, and E for enthusiasm, education, energy, engagement between the patient and the doctor. If your pa patient is enthusiastic, energetic, you become more aggressive. That is his glycemic personality. If she says, doctor, please don't trouble me, you just give me one or two tablets so that I can carry on with my life. I don't want to be troubled. You respect her wishes and then you go slow. So sure, let us look at it in another way now. If the symptoms and severity of hyperglycemia are high and you have to choose an oral drug above metformin, the first choice would be sulfonylurea, glimepiride glyclozide. If you want a U for umbrella of protection, then GLP-1-RA and SGL-2 inhibitors. If there is a risk of hypoglycemia or you are not very sure that patient will come back to you for follow-up, then DPP-4 inhibitor. Lenagliptin is one drug which requires minimum uh, investigations before being prescribed. You don't need to do RFT, uh, renal function. You don't need to do uh, hepatic function tests. And E was for excessive weight here, the same sure. If the weight is more and the patient says, my main concern is weight, I want to lose weight, then GLP-1-RA would be the only choice. Sticking at four, let us just repeat what we have said. So now we have this framework in mind, two, three, four classifications. It's quite easy to do in the OPD. But do remember that when you're taking a history, first pin down the chief complaint or concern, pin it down. Then look at the CV risk. Also look at the adiposity or the circumference of your patient and see whatever concerns or caveats the patient has. So ask the patient, will you be able to take two tablets a day? Will you be able to take six tablets a day? Just ask, find out. And once again, when you're taking a history, first you pin down the cardinal issue, the complaints and concerns. Then you take a history or you evaluate for comorbid conditions and complications. After that, you take a history of corrective measures taken so far. What is the medication you've been taking? And are there any constraints? So if you follow this one, two, three, four, then you don't make a mistake in the OPD. And like I said, I can count only up till, I, th I think I can manage up till five. You ca I can count only up till four, so this is what I do in the OPD. I do not go beyond that. Once you've done that, you just put the pharmacology and the patient's physiology together. And you come up with a comprehensive plan. So I would just like to repeat once again, in the diabetes OPD, there is so much to do. But if you are able to pin down the chief complaint or concern, you focus on that, that is bullseye. After that, you keep on expanding your circle of influence and you keep on expanding the impact of your therapy. If you do that in a pragmatic way, then you are through in diabetes practice. So you should be able to pin down the chief complaint or concern and then address it for each and every patient in your OPD. You should be able to manage the secondary issues like, for example, CV benefit, 
and long-term requirements in most of your patients. If you can do that, then uh, we are done. And uh, I am mindful of time. That is what happens in the diabetes clinic as well. So you can always say there will be a next time. So the rest we will discuss next year. Thank you.